Start clapping right now and make it loud for Noah Garden Swartz. What's going on, everybody? How we doing? We good? It's great to be here with all of you. Appreciate you all coming out. Uh, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home, so truly great to be here. <laughs> Nowhere else I'd rather be right now. And I love my kids. They're great. But it's a lot. There's a lot going on at the house. We recently potty trained a three-year-old, and we did it using bribery. <laughs> Gave him a cookie every time he took a shit on the toilet. <laughs> and after that, for the next few weeks, he just stayed trying to take a shit. <laughs> just all day, every day, sitting on the toilet, trying to force one out so he could get a cookie. <laughs> he called them his poo-poo cookies. Which is adorable, but it's also really smart because he was making a connection in his mind between what he wants and what he has to do to get what he wants. So he calls them his poo-poo cookies for the same reason I tell my wife I did the pussy dishes. <laughs> and... It's all about establishing that Pavlovian connection. Wife comes home middle of the day in the week. He's on the toilet. I'm at the sink washing dishes. Like, what the hell's wrong with you guys? I'm like, we both want cookies. That's all. <laughs> the cookies were a slippery slope for him, though, because my son is fully addicted to sugar. And I'm sure you guys are like, he's three years old. This is America, of course. We all are. And I get it. But I didn't realize the depth of his addiction until I saw how far he's willing to go to get anything with just a modicum of sugar in it because he's memorized the hierarchy of foods with sugar dosages, and he'll just go down the line from the heavy hitters to things with just a little bit until he can get his fix, you know? Because he'll be like, can I have donuts? We're like, no. He's like, can I have cake? We're like, no. He's like, can I have juice? We're like, no. The other day he goes, can I get a fig? <laughs> Is that not the most depressing shit you've ever heard <laughs> in your life? A three-year-old sugar addict who needs a hit of sugar so bad, he's like, Man, can I get a fig? <laughs> Come on, I'll suck your fig. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's wild. But I understand. I have a sweet tooth. I have a sweet tooth myself. I don't have a great diet, but I do combat not having a great diet by trying to stay active. And my activity of choice, the way I like to exercise, is I play basketball. I've been a lifelong basketball player, 39 years old. I still play basketball several nights a week. But because I'm 39, my body doesn't recover the way that it used to. <laughs> Several months ago, I started experiencing a little bit of knee pain in my right knee, so I went to the doctor, found out that I already have a little bit of arthritis in my right knee. Yeah, the cartilage is already degenerating a little bit. My wife wants a nose job. <laughs> we legitimately asked the doctor if it was possible to take the cartilage from her nose. <laughs> and stick it in my knee. <laughs> and it's not, but I don't understand why it's not. Like, it feels like a fair one-to-one -one trade. She doesn't want it, I need it, who's losing, you know? <laughs> Apparently the science isn't there yet, but it makes sense to me. And if you think about it, it really is like the Jewish equivalent to a Brazilian butt lift. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> reallocating the body's resources. Everyone else take a little bit of that tummy fat, stick it in their ass. Those Jews are like, yeah, I'll take your nose, stick it in my knee. It'll <laughs> help extend my playing career at the Valley Beth Shalom 35 and up league for a few more years. Which is a real league that I do play in and dominate, by the way. <laughs> I'm a six foot four Jew. I am the LeBron James Nikola Jokic of the Valley Beth Shalom 35 and up league. I'm giving these rabbis and lawyers 26, 12, and 8, no problem. <laughs> Damn near triple doubles every game, barely breaking a sweat. At this point, I do it for my ego more than my physique. <laughs> but like, I used to be a real athlete. And in high school and college, I was like a shredded, jacked athlete. And then I just gained two to three pounds a year for 15 to 20 years straight. <laughs> And because it was like that slow, gradual build, because it was like a marathon, not a sprint to the weight gain, I never had this weird rock bottom moment where I looked in the mirror one day, I was just like, holy shit, you let yourself go. You know, it happened gradually enough that I didn't really notice. And then I had a weird moment of self-awareness a few weeks ago. Let me preface this by saying, 
when I was in high school, I thought the lead singer of Smash Mouth was the fattest man on earth. Like, <laughs> if you would have asked late 90s, early 2000s Noah who's fat, I would have been like Tony Soprano and the lead singer of Smash Mouth. <laughs> Obviously. A few weeks ago, I'm laying in bed on a random Tuesday night, flipping through TV channels, and I land on a channel that's playing old music videos, and this channel played the video to Smash Mouth's All Star. And I was looking at the video, and I was just like, I could share clothes with the lead singer of Smash Mouth. <laughs> and that was a moment of self-awareness I wasn't prepared for, to be 39 years old on a Tuesday night, just thinking to myself, was I too hard on the lead singer of Smash Mouth? <laughs> And the answer is definitively yes. I owe him an apology. <laughs> the gradual weight gain, I think, a lot for me came from the fact that my guilty pleasure food is pizza. I love pizza. You're never going to lose weight. probably going to gain a little bit of weight when you consistently eat pizza. Before I lived in California, I lived in New York for close to a decade. New Yorkers take their pizza very seriously. I remember one time I was in a pizzeria in New York City, and I saw a man trying to put red pepper flakes on his slice of pizza and the holes on top of the red pepper shaker were too small for the red pepper flakes to escape through. <laughs> so this guy was just shaking the shit out of it with nothing coming out. And finally, he got so frustrated, he looked to me for consolation. And he was just like, fucking New York City, huh? Anything to save a buck. <laughs> and I just love the mindset of a man who thinks that there's a small business owner out there who could afford to pay rent in New York City, but cuts costs on a spice that's like $3 per metric ton. <laughs> Who's doing this guy's cost-benefit analysis? You know, like, he got so angry about the pepper shaker that it turned him into a full-blown conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Where in the back of his mind, there's some diabolical pizza shop owner that's just like, what? They raised rent? Shrink the pepper shaker holes. <laughs> I got a business to run, I gotta keep the lights on. I can't let these flakes out the door all willy-nilly. Grab the pepper shakers, cover them in tin foil, poke a hole no bigger than a toothpick. No flakes out the door on my watch. But now I'm like, shit, the way inflation is going, I get it, save those red peppers. That, that might actually affect the bottom line in 2023. But everything has gotten expensive, not just food. Gas is crazy expensive, which makes it harder to travel. But we'll say, if the last few years, the pandemic taught me anything personally, it was that it's really important to show up for people when you can. Like, even if it's expensive to be there, to drive, to fly, when you have moments that bring happiness and togetherness amongst the people you care about, show up when you can. So that's why last year, even though the plane ticket was incredibly expensive, I flew home to be with my father on his birthday because it was a milestone birthday. Last year, my father turned 69. <laughs> Nice, exactly, nice. <laughs> yeah, 69, it's a silly birthday, but I wanted to be there, and as a comedian, I felt the pressure to get him a funny gift. So for my father's 69th birthday, I bought him and my stepmom crotchless edible panties. <laughs> Mostly because she won't let him eat sugar anymore. <laughs> but now suddenly she doesn't care about his diabetes. <laughs> My son's like, you think edible panties are bad? I ate a fucking fig, all right? It's... <laughs> yeah, traveling, it's, it's interesting. I, I have an unpopular opinion with respect to traveling. A lot of people don't agree with this, but I actually like traveling through the big city, really busy airports, because I think the busy airports have had to learn how to be more efficient because of all the people traffic. Like, a few months ago, I did a show in Richmond, Virginia. I had to fly from Los Angeles to Richmond. At LAX in Los Angeles, I get to the airport, 200 people in front of me in line of security. Go do the show in Richmond, flying out of Richmond, get to the airport, four people in front of me in line of security. It took me longer to get through security with four people in Richmond than it did 200 people in Los Angeles. Because in the big cities, they don't actually give a shit. They don't even look at the license. They're just like, go, go, fuck off, go. <laughs> Richmond, the guy in front of me gets called up, he gives the guy his license, the guy checking ID is like, August 12th, huh? My boss's son was born on August 12th. Like, I don't give a shit, dude, I'm gonna miss my flight because you're bored and friendly at work. Let's keep that shit moving. 
One thing I have noticed as I've traveled, though, recently is we as Americans have decided to set a new low bar for how disgusting we're willing to look when we fly. Because <laughs> it used to be that we wore regular clothes throughout the week and then you wear sweatpants to fly. But we've all spent the better part of the last three years wearing sweatpants every day throughout the week. So now when you go to fly, it's like, where do we go from here? <laughs> Bathrobe and Tweety Bird slippers. <laughs> Basketball shorts and a dirty tank top seem to be the popular choices of my fellow flyers. And I'm not judging. I don't get dressed up to fly either. Recently, I was on a flight. I saw a guy get on in jeans and a polo. And I was just like, okay, Don Draper. <laughs> Look at fucking Johnny business meetings over here. How nice it must be to have somewhere to go in your closed-toed shoes. Yeah, I, I dress like shit. Like, honestly, this is a big night for me. I'm taping, recording an album. I'm in a hoodie. It's... <laughs> It is what it is. I, I've been dressed for a pandemic long before the pandemic because I got married September 1st, 2019. September 2nd, 2019, I was like sweatpants all day, every day from here on out. <laughs> I'm never having sex with a different person for the rest of my life. What real motivation do I have to not wear sweatpants in perpetuity? <laughs> Seriously, who am I trying to look good for? And some of you guys are probably like, don't you want to look good for your wife? No. And she doesn't want me looking good. She, I promise you, if I leave the house to do anything other than comedy and pants with a button, she's like, where the fuck do you think you're going dressed like that? <laughs> you're going to give these bitches the wrong idea because there's no reason a married man needs to be trying to look nice out in public. Getting dressed up is a single man's game. I'll go so far as to say, women, if you are in a heterosexual marriage and your husband doesn't wear sweatpants three to five days a week, he's cheating on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, those are just the facts. There's no reason a married man should be trying to look nice out in public. That's single man shit. It's true, if you're single, you get to go out and have fun, but you gotta wear uncomfortable clothing. If you're married, the fun is over, but you get to wear sweatpants and shit with the door open. We all know the social contract that we sign. I don't know why people are trying to switch it up. But I actually found out Last year, the real reason why my wife doesn't care if I look nice. So as I mentioned, I have a three-year-old. My wife gave birth to our first child in May of 2020. We were living in New York City at the time. So we were in the height of the pandemic, in the epicenter of the pandemic. Now, if you guys remember, March of 2020, a little documentary by the name of Tiger King came out. <laughs> so in March of 2020, my wife is seven months pregnant. We're quarantined in a tiny New York apartment. I go a little stir crazy. One night I get bored, I dye my hair blonde and shave the handlebar mustache. <laughs> and my wife loved it. She was all about it for the next few months. She fucking absolutely loved it. Fast forward a year and a half in between our two kids, I get stir crazy one night, bored again, and I randomly said to her, should I go back to the blonde hair and the handlebar mustache? She was like, fuck no. I said, but you loved it so much the first time I did it. She was like, yeah, I was seven months pregnant. If I had to look like shit, so did you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you grimy motherfucker. <laughs> and I respect it. I respect game recognizing, I'm, I'm all good with it. I'm like, you're pregnant, whatever you say goes. Like, you make the rules, that's all good, no problem. The problem was, this was the birth of my first child. And so now in all the pictures <laughs> of the birth of my first child, I look like Joe Exotic, probably <laughs> holding one of his tiger cubs. Those are memories you don't get back. But I'm actually, I'm so committed to that sweatpant lifestyle. It's like, I don't just talk about it, I am about it. You know, like, it, it's like an ideology, a life philosophy for me. And it's actually made me reevaluate past experiences that I've had. You know, like, eight years ago, I was living in New York City at the time, and one day I decided to just eat some shrooms and walk around the city. I was having what I like to call a me day. <laughs> and the shrooms kicked in, and I was feeling warm and fuzzy, at one with the universe, connected to my fellow man and woman. And I get to the park, and I look across the park, and I see an old man who appears to be homeless, sitting on a park bench in very tattered sweatpants. Again, I'm tripping, feeling good, at one with the universe, my fellow human. I approach him, try to hand him a $5 bill. And he just waved me off. And I was like, no, please, I want you to have this. 
and I tried to hand him the $5 bill again. He just goes, I'm gainfully employed, I don't need your money. <laughs> and I was always so confused as to how I misread the situation that badly. And now all these years later, I'm just like, oh, he wasn't homeless, he was married. <laughs> I was just a happily married man enjoying his day at the park in his favorite shitty sweatpants. <laughs> Minding his business before he had to go home to his wife of 40 years, hear the same stories. He probably got home. She was like, how was your day, honey? He was like, kind of weird. Some junkie tried to hand me $5. <laughs> I used to eat shrooms all the time, too. I, uh, I went through a big shroom phase, and I hadn't done shrooms for years. Like that time I just told you about was one of the last times I did shrooms for close to a decade until about a year and a half ago. Uh, as I said, my wife and I, we were first-time pandemic parents. So for our oldest kid, we were home all day, every day for the first 18 months of this kid's life. We finally convinced her parents to come watch the kid for a week so we could take our first vacation since we became parents. And we went to Hawaii for a week. And because my wife is dope, she surprised me by bringing a bag of shrooms. <laughs> and she also booked a snorkel cruise with sea turtles. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if you meant this as a one-two combo but it is now. <laughs> That's what we're doing. So the second day we got there, we ate the shrooms, and we went snorkeling with sea turtles. And we timed it out perfectly. We ate the shrooms on land, so by the time the boat went out in the water, about 30 minutes, anchored down, we were good and tripping. I get in the water, five minutes into the snorkel, I see a family of sea turtles. I look down, I see baby sea turtle, mama sea turtle, daddy sea turtle. I look down at them. They look up at me. <laughs> And underwater, I just hear, and I was just like, oh shit. They're talking to me. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. I want to share this with my wife. So I pop my head above water, and while I'm above water, I see my wife is underwater with the snorkel still in her mouth, and coming out of the top of her snorkel, I just hear, turtle, turtle, <laughs> turtle, turtle. <laughs> Like, I was tripping so hard, I thought turtles could talk to me. But she was tripping so hard, she thought she could talk to turtles. So the shrooms just brought us to opposite ends of the Dr. Doolittle spectrum. When we sobered up, got back to the hotel later that night, I asked my wife what she was trying to tell the turtles. And she said she wanted to let them know that the sunscreen she was wearing was reef safe. <laughs> And I was like, oh, wow, you were fucked up. <laughs> like, you were driven so hard, not only did you think turtles spoke English, you thought they spoke it well enough to understand the context that sometimes human beings wear something called sunscreen, and the sunscreen you were wearing would not fuck up their ecosystem. <laughs> but there's something to learn no matter where you go. And that, that's the best part of travel. And whether it's for comedy, for work, leisure. I always enjoy traveling, exposing myself to other cultures, other people. One of the best cultural experiences that I had uh, traveling last year was one of my best friends from college is an Indian man. He had a wedding. Has anyone here ever been to an Indian wedding? They're so fun. It was fantastic, right? So they asked all the guests to wear traditional Indian clothing to the wedding. Not a problem. Beautiful people, beautiful culture, beautiful clothing. The issue is... My friend has a huge Indian family. Almost all of his friends are white. So on the day of the ceremony, when his family was already gone at the venue taking pictures, we were just in the hotel lobby as a giant group of white people inexplicably dressed in Indian clothing. And I will say, if you belong to a nationality or an ethnicity that has your own custom garb, and you ask people outside of that nationality or ethnicity to wear said custom garb, you should provide a chaperone or an escort <laughs> to get everyone from point A to point B that lets other people know it's socially acceptable because without it, we just look like a group of racist white dudes who are several months late to an ill-conceived Halloween costume. So like, I wasn't feeling great. I was a little self-conscious, I was in my head as we were walking across the hotel lobby to get on the bus to go to the wedding venue. And as we're walking as this group, randomly there was one black woman on the other side of the hotel lobby who saw us and she just goes, y'all look amazing. <laughs> and I didn't know this until it happened, but I needed a black woman to validate my Indian wardrobe. 
more than I needed an Indian person to validate my Indian <laughs> origin. Because like, if his family was around and they were like, oh, you guys look great, I still would have been like, are you sure? Do you think? Like, are we pulling it off? Some random black woman was like, y'all look amazing. I was like, let's fucking go. <laughs> I'm ready for this wedding, baby. I feel like a million bucks. Because those are the rules of fashion. Black woman compliments your outfit, you keep that shit on. Black middle schooler makes fun of your outfit, you take that shit off. Immediately. Black middle schooler compliments your outfit, you keep that shit on for two days. <laughs> like, if you didn't spill on it, get tagged in an Instagram photo, you try to get two wears out of it. Traveling can be great. And I get put in a lot of precarious positions traveling, doing comedy. Uh, I remember two years ago, I got booked to do a week's worth of shows in Las Vegas. My wife is also a comedian. She got booked to do the week of shows in Las Vegas with me. Our oldest child was only a year old at the time. We didn't want to leave him at home alone with someone else for an entire week, so we brought him with us to Vegas. But because we're both doing shows at night, we had to hire a babysitter. Babysitters in Vegas are so expensive, we just hired a prostitute. <laughs> Like, fuck it, this makes more sense for the budget. <laughs> They're like, is there anything we need to know? I was like, yeah, he has a baby dick. Don't make him feel weird about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy, though, because my son literally learned to walk like three days before we went to Vegas for a week. And all of a sudden, I was just like, yeah, you've been walking for 72 hours. You're ready to dodge lit cigarettes and crush beer cans. <laughs> Out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> teaching your kid how to walk in Vegas is like teaching your kid how to talk in the South Stands at a Philadelphia Eagles game. It's like, they might accomplish the mission, but you're not going to like everything they come back with. <laughs> but I've always had a, a special place in my heart for Vegas because I love to gamble. Uh, I'm actually a compulsive gambler. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. I come by it honestly. My mother was a compulsive gambler to the point where when I was 16 years old, she actually made me get a fake ID so that she could take me to Vegas and teach me to play craps. <laughs> it's true. Taught me to bet on myself. Great life advice, horrible craps advice. We lost so much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I am a compulsive gambler. I even tried Gamblers Anonymous once. Didn't work for me. Too many losers in there. I, uh... <laughs> I was there looking for hot tips on the money line. They were sharing their sob stories. I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm here for. <laughs> but of course, I'm not making fun of anyone that struggles with addiction. We all have our own thing, whether it's gambling, drugs, alcohol, sex, food. Everyone has something they're trying to kick. And I respect people who go through the program. Actually, a few months ago, one night, I randomly got an email, completely out of the blue, from one of my best friend's ex-girlfriends, who was in Alcoholics Anonymous at the time. And she was at the point of her 12 steps where she was making amends. And so she wrote me an email to make amends and she wanted to apologize for all the great nights that my best friend and I could have theoretically had that she ruined by being a drunken mess. And I'm not even making fun of her. I thought it was incredibly gracious and humble of her to be willing to apologize to someone who was tangentially affected by theoretically bad behavior. Whereas if I actually stuck with Gamblers Anonymous long enough to make it to the amends, my emails would have been way more petty. <laughs> you know, it'd have been like, Dear Megan, I'm sorry I called you a stupid bitch for quote unquote ruining the vibe at a hot craps table. <laughs> <laughs> in all fairness, I had money on the pass line, max odds in the back. The point was six, which is statistically speaking the second most likely number to come up. <laughs> I also had money on the four, five, eight, nine, and ten, so yeah. <laughs> a lot of money out there on the table. The only number that could have come up to cost me all that money is a seven, which I don't want to point fingers, did coincidentally roll as soon as you came to the table <laughs> and said, how's everyone doing tonight? So again, shouldn't have called you a stupid bitch. <laughs> that was my bad. And whenever you're ready to apologize for your part in things, <laughs> My doors are always open. I don't even want the money back. Just the apology. That's my growth. That's my journey. It's... Do we have any craps players in here? Any gamblers in here? No? Nothing? Ponies. What? Ponies. Oh, shit. You're a real fucking addict. I'm like, <laughs> you bet on horses, you make me look normal at the craps table. Yeah, gambling is my addiction. I... 
I do feel fortunate that I've never struggled with drug addiction because I've done a lot of drugs, but I've always been able to do the drugs I want to do and then just not do them when I no longer want to do them. I've never struggled to actually, that's, there is one, the only drug I ever truly had trouble getting off of was NyQuil. And <laughs> I don't know if we have any quill heads in the building. When I was in my early 20s, I used to have to take NyQuil every night to fall asleep. And NyQuil will fuck you up. Especially if you actually need it. If you actually have a head cold, NyQuil will put you on your ass. So years ago, before I lived in New York, I used to live in Atlanta. One night in Atlanta, I had a bad head cold. I drank some NyQuil. Swear to God, this is true. As luck would have it, that night, a drunk driver drove his car into my house. I did not wake up. I slept through the entire thing. Woke up in the morning, a third of my house was gone. You know what else was gone? My cold. <laughs> NyQuil, it's very effective, it's good shit. <laughs> One time after a show, someone was like, I think you should do that for a commercial for NyQuil. I was like, I think you missed the point of the joke. But... <laughs> I still struggle with sleep. Not a good sleeper. Part of it is I make bad decisions right before bedtime, consistently the same bad decision. Perhaps some of you guys can relate to this. You know when you are so exhausted, you know as soon as you get in bed and your head hits the pillow, you're gonna fall asleep. You are so tired, have to pee just a little bit. <laughs> so tired, you're gonna fall asleep right away, have to pee just a little bit. But you're closer to the bedroom than you are the bathroom. So you make that executive decision. You're like, fuck it. I'll just wake up in the morning and have to pee real bad. But I know I'm good because I am so tired. As soon as I get in the bed, I'm going to fall asleep. What happens? Get in bed. Have to pee just a little bit. <laughs> and even though you're so tired, you can't get comfortable. So you fluff the pillow. Still just have to pee a little bit. <laughs> a few more minutes pass. Now you get hot. Stick your foot out from under the cover. <laughs> Still just have to pee a little bit. A few more minutes pass. Fuck it, now you're cold. Bring that foot back in. Still just have to pee a little bit. Five more minutes pass. You get hot again, but you already tried the foot out thing, so now you take off your shirt. Taking off your shirt messes with the pillows that you fluffed up so perfectly. Still just have to pee a little bit. It's another five or ten minutes before, ah, you're finally comfortable enough to fall asleep. But now you have to pee so goddamn bad. There's no way you're falling asleep. And you won't get up to pee because you fought so hard to get comfortable, but even though you're comfortable, you can't fall asleep because you have to pee so bad. So what do you do? You do nothing. You lay there like an asshole, <laughs> suffering for the next 30 minutes, refusing to get up to pee because you fought so hard to get comfortable until you literally can't take it anymore. Your bladder's about to burst. You finally get up. You go pee. And while you're up and peeing, you're like, well, now that I'm up, I may as well grab a glass of water. And the entire cycle repeats itself. <laughs> It's like the M.C. Escher stairwell painting version of nighttime rituals. <laughs> that reference is for four people, every audience. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I don't sleep well, but I've never been more exhausted in my life. Because as I said, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. When you have a toddler and an infant in the house, sleep just doesn't exist. Sleep is a non-existent thing in our house. My wife and I have reached new levels of exhaustion that we did not know existed. And I'll give you an example of how tired we are now. Before we had children, my wife and I had an inside joke in our relationship. Or like, if I ever saw an attractive woman and pointed her out, my wife would be like, well, go and fuck her then. But if you do, I'm going to fuck the guy at the gym. Or if she ever saw an attractive man and pointed him out, I'd be like, well, go and fuck him then. But if you do, I'm going to fuck the barista at the coffee shop. You know, an inside joke like couples have. <laughs> now that we have kids, a few weeks ago, we're sitting in traffic, car pulls up to us in the lane over, my wife looks at the car next to us, looks back at me, and she's like, oh, that's a good-looking guy. And I honestly said, well, go and fuck him then. But if you do, get a babysitter so I can have a few hours to myself. <laughs> and I meant that shit <laughs> from the depths of my soul. I was like, truly, we're good. I love you, you love me, we're fine. Go fuck him, have a great time. I need to be left alone. Like, at this point in my life, I need a nap more than I need fidelity. Because it's exhausting. Kids are all-consuming, 
and we actually raise our kids. I know it's rare, but we pride ourselves on the fact that we are actually the ones raising our kids. We don't live near any of the grandparents for help. We don't have a nanny. We are raising our kids on our own. I would love to get a nanny. My wife won't let us because she's scared that I would fuck the proverbial hot nanny. <laughs> she says, if we get any help, it has to be an obese au pair. <laughs> and I'm just like, that is so messed up. Like, do you really think that I wouldn't fucking obese au pair? <laughs> All women are beautiful. We don't body shame. Anyone can get it, okay? It's... <laughs> no, it's, it's important. to Any help you can get with your kids is essential, which is why when we moved from New York to L.A., before we even looked for places to live, like before we even found a house or an apartment, the first thing we made sure to find was a daycare for our child. And I absolutely love the daycare that we found for my son. Uh, it was amazing. It was a Spanish immersion daycare. And for a while, my son wasn't speaking, but he started rolling his R's when he cried. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I was like, he was not doing that a month ago, but that's, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> My oldest son, very smart. He loves books. He's only three years old, so like obviously he can't read, but physically he loves books. So sometimes he'll go over to the bookshelf and just grab a book, which is really cute to see. But then he got into this bad habit where he would open up a book and just start tearing pages out of it. And I was like, oh, well, that's horrible. I don't want him ruining books. You know, like if he's gonna ruin books, then I should just go buy him the type of book that deserves to be ruined in the first place. You know, like, I just go buy him a copy of Mein Kampf or something like that. <laughs> but then I imagine, I go buy it, and cashier looks at me like I'm crazy, and I'm like, no, 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 it's for my child. <laughs> <laughs> kids don't know shit, though. It's like, kids are really smart, but they also don't know shit. Like my three-year-old, he got his first boner a few weeks ago. In the middle of the night, he had no idea what was happening. He was so scared, he came into our room crying with his little boner just hanging out of his pajama pants. And he just goes, what's in it? And my wife was like, daddy, he's scared. Tell him what's in it. And I was like, that's not gonna help. <laughs> oh, don't be scared, son. Your penis is just filled with blood. <laughs> like, But it, it has been fascinating relearning things through a child's eyes. You know, because like as adults, we all have so much foundational knowledge that we've known for so long that we forgot to question how, where, why, when we even learned it. We almost just accept it as like innate knowledge. And now that I'm relearning through a child's eyes, I'm questioning things I never questioned before. You know, like I never questioned the colors of the rainbow. I just learned Roy G. Biv, memorized that shit, and was like, yeah, that's the rainbow. And then a few weeks ago, my son was watching Sesame Street. They were talking about the rainbow, and I was like, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. How the fuck did indigo sneak its way in here <laughs> with all these heavy hitters? Like, these are primary colors, and we're talking about indigo. Like, I could ask this room full of educated adults right now, close your eyes, picture indigo. Most of you don't know what color indigo is, <laughs> but we're teaching it with the reds, the oranges, the yellows. That would be like if we were teaching kids vegetables, and we're like, there's peas, carrots, broccoli, and jicama. It's like, what the fuck? And it's a... <laughs> yes, indigo and jicama in time, but not before they can tie their shoes. <laughs> I like to watch TV, though. I think it is a good source of information. I'm not scared of screen time. I think it's all about what you watch, not watching in general that's bad. I like to watch a lot of Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, and in watching a lot of that, I've also learned that like compared to other species babies, human babies don't know shit. <laughs> like compared to other species babies, human babies come out with zero functionality for survival. And it's fascinating to me that within the tiny, tiny window of things that human babies innately come out able to do, one of them is breastfeed. And I know this sounds crazy, but if you think about it, that is one of the stronger arguments I could make for the fact that God is a man. <laughs> Just hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> Women are smarter. 
If God was a woman, human babies would come out with way more capabilities and functionality. If God was a woman, we'd be like, hey, female God, what should human babies come out able to do? And she's like, well, as a woman, I know how exhausting it was to carry a child for nine to 10 months of uh, pregnancy. So I want to make sure once they're born, I don't need to literally carry them anymore. Human babies are going to come out able to walk. Like, what else, female God? What else should human babies come out able to do? She's like, well, as a woman, I certainly value communication. We're going to make sure human babies come out able to talk. We're just like, hey, male God, (laughs) what should human babies come out able to do? He's like, I don't know. Guess it'd be cool if they could, like, suck tits or something. (laughs) I love how in this example, God's not only a man, he's a bro. (laughs) He's like, hell yeah, milk them sweater puppies, baby. (laughs) Of course, I'm not trying to sexualize babies or children anyway. Although I do have one running bit in the house that I think is really funny. It almost never fails. Sometimes when my one-year-old is really upset and crying at night, my wife will bring him into the bed to try to calm him down. And if he's like really throwing a fit, he'll wiggle around and sometimes he loses an article of clothing. And when that happens, I'll just pick up his tiny little baby sock and I just look at my wife and I go, who is he? (laughs) Who the fuck is he? Was it good? Did you like it? (laughs) It's a good bit. But yeah, having, having these two kids has made me realize that like the human nature is we never allow people to accomplish goals and live in that moment of accomplishing the goal before we ask what's next. Because when you have babies, people be like, oh, is he crawling? As soon as they crawl, they're like, oh, is he going to walk soon? Once they start walking, they're like, oh, is he going to talk soon? It's like, just let him have done the thing before we worry about what's next. And we don't just do that with babies. We do that with adults as well. I'm sure if there are people here on dates tonight, you've experienced it. You tell people that you met someone that you like, and instantly they're like, oh, are things getting serious? Like, yeah, things are getting serious. Oh, are you guys going to get engaged? Yeah, we got engaged. Oh, so you guys are getting married? Yeah, we got married. Oh, are you going to have children? Yes. Oh, are you going to raise them Jewish? Yes. Oh, are they going to be a doctor? Yes, they're going to be a doctor. (laughs) Oh, are they going to be a real doctor or like a chiropractor or a dentist? (laughs) They're going to be a real doctor. Oh, great. Can he look at this thing on my back? No, he's very busy. (laughs) Too busy to date because I have a daughter. Maybe they'll start dating. It'll get serious. They'll get engaged. They'll get married. They'll have a kid. It's like, shut the fuck up. It's it's too much. Getting pregnant with a second child uh, was a process. And so there was a while where, like, once a month, I'd have to go to CVS or Walgreens and buy a pregnancy test. And when you're in the process of trying to get pregnant, real life doesn't stop. Like, you still have to go about your everyday life and other shit happens. And so I remember one time I had to go to CVS and buy a pregnancy test and a plunger. (laughs) And I felt so much more vulnerable and exposed (laughs) buying a plunger than I ever did buying a pregnancy test. You know, because buying a pregnancy test, they're just like, oh, okay, this guy fucks. <laughs> buying a plunger, they're like, this guy fucks toilets up with <laughs> massive shit? Get away from my register. <laughs> I remember one time when I was buying a pregnancy test, on my way out, the cashier very sweetly said to me, good luck, which was nice, but I realized she had no clue if I wanted a positive or a negative. Like, <laughs> She had no clue what I was hoping for with this pregnancy test, but either way, good luck is the correct response. And I was like, oh, a pregnancy test has to be the only kind of test that works that way. Like, can you imagine going to take a COVID test or an AIDS test? And they're like, hey, either way, good luck out there. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> yeah, buying the plunger was just an extra layer of what the fuck. And I don't know... I think there are a few married couples in here. I don't know if anyone, married couple, long-time relationship, maybe you can relate. I've realized that 90% of the time, if my wife and I have a horrible fight, it just turns out that one of us was constipated. <laughs> and it just like made us grumpy. for what, and that, that just caused a fight. We're just like, oh, remember last week when I said I love you, but I don't know if I'm in love with you? I just needed more fiber in my diet. <laughs> Remember last week when you told me you hate me and my entire extended family? You ate too much cheese. Oops. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking getting old. Me and my wife used to eat shrooms. Now me and my wife eat prunes. (laughs) Either way, after we eat them, we look at each other and go, see you on the other side. (laughs) But yeah, the, 
the second kid was a trip. You know, the, the crazy thing when you have your second kid, especially when the first kid is a toddler, is like, I completely forgot how to have a newborn because I was so fully enthralled by being a toddler dad at that point that all the information I previously had for the first time I had a newborn just went out the window. And like, I had the same books, but I wasn't gonna reread them. You know, like, I'm not gonna study for a test that I already passed. <laughs> it's kind of like, here's, a, here's the best example I could give you. You know when you're in high school and you take trigonometry and you learn slope intercept form? Now I'm 39 years old, I still know it's Y equals MX plus B, but I no longer know what the fuck that means. It's <laughs> so like, having your first kid is taking trigonometry in high school, and having your second kid is trigonometry in your 30s, where you're just like, well, I kept the first triangle alive, we're gonna hope that all goes well. It's, <laughs> it's gonna have to. People tell you all the time too, when you go from one to two, they're like, eh, now you're just switching from zone defense to man-to-man -man defense. I'm like, yeah, that's fine, except my wife is a shitty defender. <laughs> great offensive player, great offensive skills. Fantastic at being a mother, reading at bedtime, cooking meals, giving baths, but discipline, changing diapers, horrible defender. She doesn't protect the weak side. Now I got to deal with the rim and the three-point line. What the fuck? It's like, do I deal with the one-year-old who's about to roll off the bed or the three-year-old who's running with scissors and drinking bleach? I don't know. It's... The cool thing about having the second kid is you've already gone through birth and labor one time, so that makes that process a little bit easier. Our second child was a scheduled C-section, so we got to pick the day that my wife was gonna give birth. And when you have a scheduled C-section, you get a window of like seven to 10 days that you can pick it in. And our seven to 10 day window just happened to perfectly drop between like when the child would be a Gemini or a Cancer. And my wife is super into zodiac and horoscope science, so she like really cares. She was like, you don't understand the ramifications it's gonna have on the rest of the kid's life, depending on what we do. <laughs> and she was like really torn up inside. She didn't know if she wanted to have a Gemini or a Cancer. Her mom came to visit for a week. Her mom is a Cancer. Our child is a Gemini. And so, <laughs> it's like sometimes the answer is right underneath your nose. And you know, I will say this, because I feel like it's a younger crowd. I'm picking up the vibe that there's not a lot of parents in here, but maybe some of you guys will be one day parents. And I'll leave you guys with this last piece of advice, because when I was a first time expecting parent, you get a lot of unsolicited parenting advice, most of which doesn't help, because you don't actually know what you need until you meet your kid. But if there was one piece of advice I wish I would have gotten that I never received, it's this. If and when you decide to have children, and if and when you decide to give that child a stuffy, a lovey, a blankie, the stuffed animal comfort item that's gonna help them out, don't get them something that's mass produced that a lot of other children can have the same version of. Because my oldest child, we got him a stuffed monkey from Ikea. We named it Gaga so he could easily remember it and say it. My son absolutely fell in love with Gaga. Sleeps with Gaga, tries to dress Gaga, kiss Gaga, feed Gaga, loves Gaga. A few months ago, we went to the LA Zoo, did not bring Gaga. And on the way out, we saw another young boy leaving with Gaga. And my son's heart shattered. <laughs> he was devastated. I could see the betrayal in his eyes. And he was reaching out after. He was like, Gaga! Gaga! And as his father, I was devastated for him. But I also saw it as a teachable moment. So I pulled him to the side, and I was like, hey, bro. Gaga belongs to the streets now. <laughs> Your bitch chose, homie. It's a cold world, Tim, but it's better you learn that now than never. So anyway, I'm going to go take care of the kids, but you guys have been great. Thank you so much for coming out. Have a good night. Get home safely.